Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm gonna uh, just want to say hi. Um, we're gonna be presenting this third journal club. I have, it is an honor for me to be speaking to you. And uh, I know today's not Earth Day. It's a couple of days late, but from my screen to yours, I hope you're staying safe wherever you are, wherever this finds you. Thank you to all of those that are staying in the front lines, and uh, we we all do appreciate what you're doing. So today we're gonna we're gonna present this this article entitled "Surgical Outcomes and Efficacy for Alpha Isthmusectomy in Single Ismic Papillary Thyroid Carcinoma." This study was performed in South Korea, and but in the Department of Otorhinolaryngology uh, Laryngology and Head and Surgery of the Hanyang University Hospital. Um, the authors uh, report that they have no conflict of interest, or mm, neither did they received any funds to uh, perform this project. The primary objective of this, of this paper is to investigate the clinical efficacy of thyroid dysmistectomy uh, using two uh, primary outcomes. The first one is the surgical uh, aspect of that, the surgical outcomes, which compile a series of data, including um, PTH values, TSH values, meaning uh, if the patient had any complications that might have caused any endocrine uh, complications or recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy or hematomas. And the second outcome would be prognosis that is defined as a disease-free survival. This is a little introduction. We have throughout time had this uh, question and, and this problem. We, we encounter every now and then a patient that has a solitary ismic nodule. However, it's not clear or we don't know sometimes what the extent of the surgery needs to be being that there's uh, contradictory evidence that says that maybe ismic uh, PTC might be more aggressive, and up to date there has no, there has been no clear explanation of why we could uh, maybe hypothesize that uh, PTC in this place might hold a different biology from uh, if we could call it lower PTC. So many of the entities or societies that have put up uh, uh, guidelines they generally agree with the concept that low-risk capillary thyroid cancer that is more than one centimeter, meaning that it's not a microcarcinoma, or le and that is less than four centimeters, has no gross ETE, has no li uh, evident lymph nodes pre-op, and could either undergo a total thyroidectomy or a lobectomy. However, there's no mention or no clear recommendation for ismostectomy, and this is why the authors uh, pose this, this uh, question for this study. So they included patients that underwent thyroidectomies from 2003 to 2019 for solitary papillary thyroid cancer in the isthmus. Those had to be, um, those could have been with, with or without central lane dissection, and those had to be biopsied and received a, a, a result of a test of five or six, meaning uh, suspicious or malignant, um, and, have, and they needed to have had a histopathology confirmed for PTC after surgery. Those patients that had um, clinically suspected lymph nodes uh, pre-op, the, the presence of gross extrathyroidal extension, or were considered to be intermediate or high suspicion and nodules based on preoperative scanning that were found in places other than the isthmus were excluded. And I and I added a little asterisk here. I just want to bring this up because the the authors never defined what intermediate or high suspicion nodule was. I'm assuming that they mean that based on ultrasound findings, but that, that's not clear to say. So I'll come back to that when we discuss this paper. So for, the, for this study, uh, the population was divided into three groups according to the surgical approach. This was the, this, it, we have to make this clear. This is a retrospective observational study. It's, it's uh, not randomized at all. And it was divided into three groups, either those people that underwent a total thyroidectomy with or without uh, central neck dissection, those who went, underwent an isthmusectomy plus a hemithyroidectomy, meaning the ipsilateral lobe was um, excised, or uh, an isthmusectomy alone. For this paper, the data collected were basic characteristics of the patients, pre-op ultrasound findings, surgical outcomes, histopathological findings, uh, information about the recurrence, which is not clearly defined as if patients were um, considered positive for recurrence, based on uh, imaging findings or thyroid globulin titers or antibody titers, should I say, and um, survival outcome. 
some definitions that are really important to keep in mind for this for this study. For the purpose of this study, uh, permanent uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy was defined as that that um, persisted for more than six months. Hypoparathyroidism was defined as PTH levels alone with no calcium levels, lower than 15 uh, picograms per milliliter. And permanent hypoparathyroidism was the same, but persisting for more than six months. So ultimately, the, the authors identified 212 patients with ischemic PTC during the time period I, I mentioned. 91 patients were excluded based on the presence of suspicious lymph nodes, gross ET, or multifocality. And 121 patients were included for, for the anal statistical analysis of this paper. Here I present to you the table one, which is only uh, describing the characteristics of the population studied. Uh, in the right, I allowed myself to make a couple of charts. So this is more illustrative for you, for you watching in your screens. Um, the bulk of the population, 93% of that, were of female gender. Um, the most co uh, common surgical approach in these population was to a total thyroidectomy. 57% of, of the patients uh, received a total thyroidectomy. 33% had a lobectomy plus uh, a nystrostectomy. And the remaining 9% had nystrostectomy alone. 86% of the population underwent uh, central neck dissection, and 14% of those did not uh, don't suppress it. In this slide, and I know it's uh, 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 quite small for you to, to see, but I'm going to try to zoom in so to see if you can see it better. Um, they compared the three, the three uh, groups, the total thyroidectomy group, the lobectomy versus mastectomy, and this mastectomy alone group. And you can see that it is, it is interesting to see that the size of each group is, is not comparable. And it's mastectomy alone, which is probably the main purpose or the main focus of this study is by far the smallest group only having 11 patients. In the right-hand side column, we have the p-values for all of the, of the variables that were um, analyzed in this project. And I will, I will jump ahead um, so we can save a little bit of time and have more time for discussion and go to the, those variables that were found to be statistically significant. The first one of them was the tumor size. And as you can see in the different shades of red, the, the group with the biggest tumors was the group with, that underwent total thyroidectomy. Um, also, that was, likewise, that was the group that had the, the most uh, lymphovascular invasion. And interestingly enough, the second group with the most lymphovascular invasion was not the group that had the uh, ismostectomy plus lobectomy. It was the one that had ismostectomy alone. Again, I have, to, I have to make this really clear that any, diff, any change, if we had one patient more or one patient less present any of these very um, features in this group, in the, in the group of ismostectomy alone, that would make a, a very um, sizable change that would probably impact the, the p-value being that it's so, such a small sample. Um, furthermore, um, hypo, hypoparathyroidism was found and probably expected to be found more in, in the group with a uh, total thyroidectomy. The same situation happened with patients that needed uh, level thyroxine re uh, re uh, replacement, being that all of the patients in the, in the total thyroidectomy group needed level thyroxine, and only one patient in the group with his vasectomy alone needed level thyroxine. I asked myself the questions, and since we don't have many things reported in this study, could that patient that received this mastectomy alone have had positive anti uh, antibodies, meaning is this patient possibly had uh, Hashimoto disease or any other uh, cause of hyperthyroidism because we wouldn't expect the patient with such a small procedure to, to develop hyperthyroidism post-operatively. Sorry. Moving forward, um, the, the uh, authors present this Kaplan-Mayer curve, um, trying to show the disease-free survival in all of three in all three groups, and which you can see um, uh, shown in different colors. The ismostectomy group was the group in white, in blue you can see total thyroidectomy group, and in green you can see lobectomy plus ismostectomy group. These, although you can see diff a difference between the lines, these show no statistical significance, meaning that after 80 months follow-up, at least from what they present, there is no statistical difference in, in, in recurrence in these patients. Again, I feel like if one patient would have recurred in this mastectomy group, this, this uh, 
Captain America would have uh, shown differently. And we were speaking of a different scenario. So undergo a central neck infection. When we divide the, the population based on the T, the tumor uh, aggressiveness or the primary tumor adv advancement based on the T and M staging, um, we see that the that most of the population were found to be T1, meaning that they were less than two centimeters and confined to the thyroid gland. Um, we, it was uh, interesting to me that 1.7 percent, meaning that two patients from this cohort were uh, described as T3, which means they were big nodules, and I could only think that they were they were more than four centimeters, but had no gross ET, being that that would have excluded them from the from the study. When we speak about the thyroid nodules, um, I, the bulk of the population had no, no, uh, excuse me, lymph nodes, I, I meant, uh, no lymph, lymph nodes I had identified, and 32% uh, of those were identified as having only perithyroid, perithyroid, thyroidal lymph nodes, and 14% were, were, were not assessed. And 14% of the population had no assessment or could not be assessed to see if they had then the sample size of this study is something that we should consider when interpreting the results. What are some limitations I found from this study? I feel the retrospective, retrospective and non-randomized nature of this study is one thing that adds a, a, a natural report bias being that anything that could have changed based on the size of the group or the, or the included patients would have changed the results, trying to make us think that there could be a, a, um, a conclusion that could be drawn from the numbers that I just presented. The sample size comes uh, tightly, uh, tightly with what I just said. It, it, it just, you can't split this apart. And I feel like to do or to come with a, a causal relationship or a, a association with these, with these the, the type of surgery. I think we should have done, uh, or we should plan to do a study where we can have a, a larger sample size a prop with a, a properly calculated sample size, and if possible, a randomized controlled trial. Um, this this uh, study had no paired controls, meaning that the the patients did not uh, show similar characteristics from the ones that were within each each group. Being also coming back to the sample size, this mastectomy group especially was really small. The definition of recurrence was not clear. We did not know if they were uh, calling recurrence. Those that had uh, uh, imag imaging uh, results that that confirmed recurrence, or if they took thyroglobulin or thyroglobulin antibodies as recurrence. The definition of hypoparathyroidism is PTH centered. It does not include symptoms or low calcium levels. And by doing that, they could have uh, categorized patients with postoperative hypoparathyroidism uh, um, in a different way if you, if you would have included calcium or symptoms into that, uh, uh, into that equation. And in the exclusions criteria, and I come back to this point, uh, imaging was, was used as a, as a, as a exclusion criteria, but they do not specify which imaging modality they use, and they do not specify which uh, classification system being the thyroid ACR, the ATA classification, and which classification they use to call uh, nodules as intermediate or high suspicion. And also, the, they, in their discussion, the, the authors, they, they speak about the safety of, of uh, doing an anismastectomy and the low rate of complications that these had compared to other the other two uh, surgical approaches, they do say that sometimes in patients with ismic um, PTC, in the in those cases where a total thyroidectomy or a dysmastectomy plus lobectomy was performed, they found thyroid nodules that were not seen before in during pre-op imaging studies, and they they go they also give that a last thing. They say. The, the multifocality, if we could say that, could have been found ipsilaterally or contralaterally, but they do not divide the isthmus or the thyroid gland very clearly to say, for example, if you had 
uh, is Ismic Nacho in the midline, which one of the two sides would you call bad? Um, if it's lateral or contralateral, and which procedure you had to decide? I I feel like, and they do mention this that th that was done based on the cr criteria of the surgeon that did the surgery, but it's not very clearly reported in the article. So as a conclusion, we could say that yes, it's mastectomy is probably a safe situ a safe procedure coming from the complication side of things. The quality of life after surgery is arguably su superior. And you could argue that because patients do have less hypoparathyroidism the way that they, they define that. They do need less uh, level of reaction replacement. They do have less uh, a lower rate of recurrent allergic nerve pal palsy. However, as far as recurrence um, uh, goes, we I don't think we can conclude anything from the from the from the results that we just um, presented. And I think that further research is needed to conclude if this is a surgical approach of choice for those nodules that are fine isolated in the thyroid gland in within the isthmus. Follow up, however, might be complicated with an isthmostectomy. As we all know, thyroglobin and thyroglobin antibodies might not be the best way to follow these patients. Imaging, might you might have to be very familiar with the anatomy, uh, being that uh, uh, patients that uh, harbor thyroid nodules in the isthmus, you might have to uh, um, differentiate that from those that might have uh, in, uh, involvement of the pyramidal lobe or maybe mis mistake uh, uh, an ismic PTC with a thyroid globulin, uh, I, 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 with a thyroid glossal duct cyst and for that need a different procedures, maybe like the cyst trunk procedure and with that a different type of resection and radioactive iodine, possibly radioactive iodine treatment. Um, in this moment, I don't know if there's any questions from the audience or anything that you would like to discuss. Yeah, thank you, um, uh, Camilo. That was great. I, um, just a, a few quick things. One of, one of the things that was apparent to me is that um, with the longest follow-up in the total thyroidectomy group, um, my inclination is that, that prob this probably reflects um, differences over the, the span of um, the, the period at which they were looking at patients, and it spans uh, close to two decades. Um, and so probably that represents historical perspectives here um, and differences in practice. The longest follow-up was certainly in the um, a total thyroidectomy group. It was upwards to the average was 68.3 months, um, as opposed to the uh, 28 months that was in the isthmus group. And as a result of that, my guess is that that's the direction that they were migrating. Um, I think the the interesting question in um, in this uh, comes comes back to uh, whether or not there's an inherent difference. And I wanted to ask Margie what their yeah. thoughts were regarding yeah. the presence yeah. of um, tumors in the isthmus. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think that there's um, phenotypically, okay? I don't think that there's any inherent difference phenotypically um, between the range of PT, isthmus PTCs and the range of, you know, lo lobe PTCs. Um, I think it's, it's obviously a structural anatomic difference. Um, I, I want to ask you, Camilo. The, you said there was like there were four PT3 isthmus uh, carcinomas. There were there were two PT3 isthmus carcinomas. Oh, two. Okay. And did they were was that commented upon in the discussion? I mean, were they were they were they PTC were they T3 by eight or were they uh, were were they PTC by the seventh or the CC? That this was all classified no. using the uh, AGCC classification Eight. system. Okay. They, uh, um, yeah, unfortunately, they do they do not um, discuss these two patients Thomas. particularly. Yeah. They they yeah. do discuss two patients that that had recurrence, but it is not noted if these if either one of these two patients were the ones that they they uh, that those, those uh, two had big uh, guys. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So it's a, it's a shortcoming already on top of a shortcoming of just eleven patients of interest. But nicely right. presented. Yeah. So 
Um, thank, one thank of you. the other things that one of the thanks, Margie. One of the other things um, is that you know their practice of doing central compartment lymph node dissections, and they did it fairly evenly across the board, um, uh, which is something that we, uh, no, you know, we have start, certainly gotten away from in patients who don't have clinically evident disease. One of um, there there is some literature looking at the distribution of lymph node involvement um, from tumors arising in geographically in different locations within the thyroid. And the isthmus um, does have a propensity to spread to prelaryngeal or, or delphian lymph node as well as pretracheal. And so I don't know if there are any sur other surgeons on this, but normally my practice now um, has been uh, to remove the isthmus and to clear those lymph, the lymph nodes that I just mentioned, the one that's sitting just above the isthmus, uh, the delphian lymph node, and lymph nodes sitting pretracheally. And that sort of keeps you away from the posterior surface in the, in the paratracheal region. And then I will send those off for frozen section. And if those should come back positive on frozen, um, then I'm more inclined uh, to proceed to, uh, to do a total thyroidectomy. The other thing I would comment is that um, in the um, in select circumstances, and I think Camila was alluding to that, um, there was um, um, there um, were um, uh, this, these were apparently pure isthmus um, tumors, and so there are times when there there is a, a laterality bias where. Um, in order to clear a tumor um, that's sitting at the junction between the isthmus and one of the lobes, um, then you need to um, you need to take that lobe as part of it. Um, I think um, Terry Scott and Maria both have some comments here, um, and uh, I believe Dr. Johnson also does. Um, uh, so, Terry, do you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah, I thought this was an excellent presentation. Thank you. And your slides Thank are you. really clear and straightforward. When I see a paper, I go through a series of things in my head. And the first thing I ask is, is this paper from a good journal? <laughs> so, regular and precious journals tend to be very secondary. And the next thing I ask is, publishing well known or from a reliable place and generally Seoul is a reliable source of information and then I want to know how many patients are being talked about and this has a you know a self-destructive bomb you really can't <laughs> talk about 11 patients right so on that right. so on that alone of information I would have rejected the paper However, it was accepted, uh, not surprising, because these journals are desperate for publication. Um, and there are a number of I was always told as a boy that a cancer in the isthmus was bad. Uh, and that's probably true. In fact, I just reviewed a paper from China um, with about 100 patients in the isthmus. Suggesting the same thing. And, and for that reason, Mark, I would say I'd do a total thyroidectomy in the wall. But I disagree with that. Right? Um, the other thing that I noticed was that in the lobectomy patients that they had, um, a huge number, I mean, 40 or 50 percent, ended up on thyroid hormone. Right. And that. Um, and I'm wondering what criteria the surgeons here today uh, at the Journal Club actually use in order to start thyroid hormone. So I was taught, and still do, not to start thyroid hormone until the TSH really rises above 15. Um, but I don't know what the criteria is in surgery these days, right? Uh, and maybe Mark and uh, Camilla can, uh, can fill me in and educate, educate us clinicians know what to expect from you guys. But really, there should not be a rush to start thyroid hormone replacement after a hemi 
thyroidectomy, but it takes some time for the thyroid gland to uh, adapt to what is needed, right? And the TSH will rise and, and stimulate hypertrophy of that gland so that it can then compensate and there's no need necessarily to start thyroid unless you worry. Those are my few comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Terry Davies. I, I, I totally agree with uh, all of the comments you made. Uh, unfortunately, myself, I am, I am trained as an endocrinologist, so I would agree with you that I would not start uh, uh, level thyroxine uh, replacement therapy unless the TSH was about 15. And the only place where I could possibly just do that if we were in a remote place where I knew my patient was most probably going to have hypothyroidism um, as a consequence of the of the procedure, and the per, the patient might not be readily tested for TSH values within a reasonable time, which is which I don't think any of the people in the room might have might have a problem with that. But uh, totally, I feel like it was surprising for me too that patients with lobectomy, and even especially that patient with an um presented with or needed a, a levothyroxine replacement. I don't know if Dr. Erkin or the, any of the surgeons in the forum might want to comment on that. So, so we normally will quote um, to patients, or I normally quote to patients that um, roughly 25% of patients who have a, um, a and if, who have a lobectomy will require some supplements. But usually, um, as Dr. Davies mentioned, I'll, I'll ride that out for a considerable period of time. Um, and base it uh, on what's happening to their TSH. Um, so that's that's my own personal um, uh, approach to that. I do want to uh, just get to some of the other questions, um, and uh, and one in particular, Dr. Johnson. And this is something why I was asking Margie um, had a, a mentioned that there is um, some literature that supports an increased propensity for extrathyroidal extension in isthmus um, cancers. And that's, um, that's something that I wanted, they, they certainly did report um, upwards to between 54 and 72% minimal ETE. Um, we've come to um, downplay uh, minimal ETE in terms of a prognostic factor but just wanted to see if Margie had any particular thoughts on to do that. Um, well, um, that's an interesting question. So and we're looking at that as, as one of our features in the PTC tall cell study, uh, because I've been now for the last um, bunch of years subclassifying the, um, the amount of, or writing my reports in such a way that if I need to go back and see, uh, is it is it focal or multifocal, and and how many how many slides are involved with microscopic ETE uh, versus how many, uh, and all also, um, is it just microscopic um, strap muscle involvement versus multifocal strap muscle involvement, and so um, I haven't done any analysis yet, um, so I can't say whether or not that's associated with a um, uh, greater likelihood of recur local recurrence. What, um, what I'm just finding preliminarily with the tall cell study is that the degree of microscopic, the degree of extra thyroid extension does associate with the degree of tall cell. But that's really preliminary and we need to really um, rigorously analyze the data and we're still collecting the data. So I'm, I'm, we're looking at that question. Um, I, in, in this study, uh, we haven't um, subclassified where the, where the sites are because many, many patients, you know, the rules of this particular study um, are that where the index tumor is the one with the most tall cells. And if all are non tall cell, then the index tumor is the uh, largest tumor. Um, so, so we're not really, you know, we haven't designed it to also, you know, um, also look at, at uh, tumor subsite, but that's something that we can we can look at in the future. Okay, Dr. Brandwine, when, 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 
I apologize. Yes, uh, when you when you when you mentioned the the association between Taltel uh, and uh, ETE, what threshold yeah. of Taltel <laughs> are you using? So so the way we we have designed the data is um, we we're, we're looking at a number of uh, we're looking at the two thresholds: the current threshold of thirty percent or more versus the last threshold of fifty percent or more. Um, so okay. so you know more to come thank you so, maria thanks uh, margie maria had a question on uh mike via um yeah i can just ask uh you know i've uh, you know a lot of opinion in, in management of thyroid cancer uh some of it is driven and i you know there's data as to nodule position within the thyroid and risk of recurrence uh, and so some of the the opinion is that uh, the closer a nodule is to the edge of the thyroid or the closer the cancer is to the edge of the thyroid uh, uh, the higher risk of recurrence and maybe this explains why there's more ETE or at least microscopic ETE seen in instances of cancer. Is there any sense, I don't see it in this chart, of how close, I mean some isthmuses are thicker than others uh, is there any uh, sense as how much thyroid tissue is seen between the, uh, these isthmus cancers and, and the, the uh, margin of thyroid? Uh, that should have been available, I would think, in the pathology reports. I don't know, was that reported in this in this trial, Camilla? No, Dr. V, and I think that that draws a very interesting point. I feel like more in pathology than in, in, in imaging, we find if the if the tumor has positive margins or gross ET, but we rarely have like a range or a distance that the thyroid nodule might have to the capsule, for example. And that's even more rare to find in imaging. And I, I feel like this is something that um, recurrently comes comes to mind. And there's people asking if, if the thyroid nodule is in the isthmus or if it's close to the back of the thyroid gland, is it more aggressive? And we want to say yes, but no. And um, unfortunately, neither in the paper, the tables, or supplementary material did we find that information. Okay, I'd like to, to add something. Yeah, so Camilla, that's, I'm glad that point is, is brought up. Um, uh, Catherine Sinclair raised this question, I don't know, a year ago or so. And that's why I also word my reports to say, um, to specify where the microscopic thyroid extension is and where a positive margin is. So that, you know, in the future we can go back and, and looking through my reports, actually see if there's a difference between superficial versus deep versus both, et cetera. What, when you okay. say where, do you mean like where within the thyroid gland or how far from the capsule it is? No, so, the, so what I routinely um, do in my reports is when there is microscopic extrathyroid extension, I'll, I'll quantify it and then I'll modify it by the site. So you'll be, you know, when you read my report, you'll see either superficially or deep or both. I'll also mm -hmm. uh, put in the slide numbers so that while, you know, you can't assume that one slide, one focus, if you see many slides that are being listed, it does give you a semi um, quantitative um, uh, idea of how much microscopic wow. extrathyroid extension there is. Um, so there is a there is a site in the CAP protocol of how far the tumor margin is. Frankly, I don't use it. I just say margins positive or negative. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, Camilo, uh, Dr. Brito had raised the question whether or not there is a meta-analysis on Isthmus PTC. Um, and somehow I remember there being one. I don't know if you came across one in, in your review. Yeah, a couple of months back when, uh, not particularly for this for this um, paper, for the, this presentation, but a couple of months back, um, I revisited that idea of asking myself if, if um, ISMIC PTC had a, a more aggressive uh, behavior. And we did find, and I believe it, it was a Chinese um, systematic review, but I, I would be lying to you if I said which was the primary objective of that study or what the question was intended for. I don't remember if it was a screening type of question or a prognosis type of question, so I would be lying to you, but I'll be more than happy to look into that 
and share with the group that it has joined um, that paper so we can review that. And if, it, if anybody finds it interesting, we can just further discuss this. But there is one, yeah, I, I, I'm positive. Thank you, Thank you um, Camilla. I think it would be valuable um, to look at um, a meta-analysis just because there's, and, and even in the comment section in the chart, uh, in, the, in the chat, we're noticing like a few um, uh, studies that have been launched um, in regards to its thyroid cancer, but because of the um, low likelihood of its mastectomies, the amount of, of cases in all of these are, are low. As an example, right. uh, I think Dr. Johnson put in a, um, a reference to an ultrasound uh, finding of papillary PTC in the isthmus compared to LOBER in regards to just the ultrasound finding. So it's not necessarily translating into the histologic result after the patient's undergone surgery, but just what the ultrasound findings are. And there's a suggestion via the ultrasound findings from those patients that the isthmus um, cancers have suggestion of extrathyroidal extension by ultrasound features. And I'm currently reviewing a study that has double the amount of isthmus cases that that study has, in which they did not find uh, that specific difference. So I think looking at a large group um, is going to be probably very necessary just because the amount of its mastectomies that are being done, like his, that we can review up, upon from his, our historic data, is, is not as high. But when we're looking at the trend towards less surgery, or less aggressive surgery or less extensive surgery from the guidelines. And, you know, many surgeons have had, you know, certain situations where they don't feel like the patient warrants an entire, low, you know, hemithyroidectomy. The question may need to be answered um, and raised for maybe not the next guidelines, but a couple of da guidelines down the road. And I think the only way to answer that is by um, looking at, at a meta-analysis. Totally, I couldn't agree more. I feel like uh, this is this is a really interesting topic. I feel the same way. I feel that based on the low number of cases, we can't conclude anything with only one center being uh, the protagonist of, of this type of study. So I couldn't agree more than a systematic review and a meta-analysis could probably help us clear that up. We just have to frame the question correctly. I would be more than happy to, to speak to, to any of you or Dr. Ekin to see if that is feasible to, um, to look at uh, moving onward. Terrific. Okay. Um, Alrighty. Um, does any um, thanks, uh, Camille? Does anyone have any other comments or questions? Okay. Um, so we will uh, be sending out announcements. Thanks again, uh, Camilo, and um, we will meet again next uh, Friday with an article. Um, that will be on a totally different topic. And as we move forward into um, into May and June, um, we will keep you apprised of what which articles and who will the who the presenters will be. Um, and uh, certainly open to discussion um, and comments and uh, recommendations uh, from all of you. So um, thank you very much, and um, everybody stay safe.